But I was thinking of an old story. This was back when we were living in the, the Dust Bowl days. And all the pastors in this small town and, and all the farmers got together to pray for rain because it was so bad out there. And they pray and they pray and it starts to rain. And they look out in the crowd and there was one little boy with an umbrella who had the faith that it was going to rain. Uh, I got an interesting email this week. Um, never got one like this before. It, uh, it, it came from one of the job websites out there and it says, are you tired of your calling? Like, What's this? And he said, we hired many pastors who have given up on their calling and work for our construction company. So if you would like to work for us, and I was like, whoa, whoa, that's, that's a little rough. There was wow. a word that a lot of people are, you know, backing away. Yeah, that was interesting. I, I, I sat back, I was like, I'm not very handy and I have nerve damage. I'm probably not going to be much help to you. <laughs> So we continue in our study of Revelation. We're going to be in chapters 11 and 12 today. So we continue to wait for this seventh angel to sound his horn. God sends judgments down on the unbelieving people, but they refuse to repent. They hold even more tightly to their sins. Up to this point, trees, the seas, the moon, the stars, the sun, they've all been damaged. God sent for five months a type of locust to torment those who have resisted God's love and forgiveness. So now things are kind of picking up a little bit. It's not so much somebody's coming up and blowing a horn and this happens and this happens. Now we're going to see a lot more action starting to happen. So we're in Revelation chapter 11. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers. But exclude the outer court, do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for forty-two months. And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy, prophesy for 1,260 days clothed, clothed in sackcloth. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the, from the abyss will attack them and overpower them and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figurative, figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because the two prophets had tormented those who live on earth. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. At that very hour, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake. And the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, the third woe is coming soon. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders 
which were seated on their thrones before God, fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and the one who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of, the, of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. So we have plenty of action going on in chapter 11. And we can tie together something written here from the, a passage in the book of Daniel. In chapter 9, we find Daniel prophesying that the enemies of the Jews will corrupt their city and temple for 42 months. This happened in 167 B.C. A ruler of the Syrian sector of the Greek Empire conquered Jerusalem and killed the Jewish people by the thousands and did all he could to destroy their faith. He put up a Greek idol in their temple and built an altar, and he took animals which were considered unclean to the Jews and sacrificed them there to the Greek gods. Now back in Revelation, we find that the Gentiles will trample the holy city it's a, and its temple for three and a half years, and then God will send his two messengers. These two powerful messengers will stand firm in the truth of God. Now many have guessed who these two are. Some say Moses and Elijah. Others say Enoch and Elijah. And still others say it's two people we haven't seen before. God has not shared their names with us in Scripture. These two will not be harmed, at least at first. It says in verse 5, If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn waters into blood and strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. So they've been given some serious power. And you know that the unbelieving people hated them. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to be convicted of their sins. They want to do what they've continued to do. Sin, sin, and sin. They don't want to listen to God. They don't want to fall in line. In verse 7 it says, Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss, now that is the bottomless pit, will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively, figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified for three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, nation, will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them, and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because the two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. So not only will they be killed, the people who still believe and follow are going to be greatly persecuted. God's people are going to have a very difficult time and a very difficult life. This city is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. Now we know in the Old Testament that Israel went to war often with Egypt and God destroyed Sodom. The demonic influence in this world will greatly increase as the people turn their backs on God. They become so evil that they celebrate these prophets being killed and they give each other gifts. They gloat over them because now those who tormented them are gone. They didn't want to hear it. They were happy that they were killed. But after three and a half days, God will bring them back. They will stand on their feet, and the people will be scared. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. Can you imagine seeing and hearing God call someone up to heaven and still not believing? 
Can you imagine how hard the hearts of the people must have been at this point? It doesn't matter what God does to them. They don't want to hear it. They refuse it. And their pride, they're going to resist him, and he's just going to go away. But he's not going to go away. And after they went up into heaven, the very hour there was a severe earthquake and the tent of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in that earthquake and the survivors were terrified and gave God the glory. And then it says the second what was passed, the third is coming. So God does this work and the enemies quake with fear. The two witnesses go up to heaven. The earthquake comes and kills all those people, 7,000 of them. And the survivors glorify God. So we know that there was a small remnant of people holding on to God. That no matter how much evil is being done all around them, they're not joining them. They're setting themselves apart. They're being different. Now you might ask, who is coming up out of the abyss to kill them? The beast that ascends from the bottomless pit is likely the first beast, which will be revealed in Revelation 13. We'll talk about that next week. He's sometimes called the Antichrist, or the Roman Prince, or the head of the revived Roman Empire. Now comes the seventh trumpet, which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. So the heavens are opened up. There are people worshiping God. We know that He is in control. His judgment time is coming. And then there are in God's temple where the Ark of the Covenant was, which is from the Old Testament. We would remember that. There are flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. God's kingdom is forever. Our Lord and our Messiah, God the Father, they will all reign forever. Then the elders fall down and worship. God's temple opens up. Any rulers of darkness who oppose him, God will rule each and every single one. He gives his rewards and he gives his punishments. Now nobody can contest these as we'll see shortly. Let's jump into chapter 12. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. A tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung him down to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth, so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumph over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you, 
He is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to a place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times and a half a time, out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep, sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. So who is the woman and who is the child? <coughs> the woman is Israel, and the child is Jesus, who is the Messiah. Who opposes her? The dragon, who is identified as Satan. He opposes the woman, but God is one step ahead of all Satan's attempts to kill or capture her. Now Satan cannot stop the Christ or Israel. Michael and his angels fight against Satan and his angels, and what happened? Satan and his angels lose. Satan is hurled down to the earth with his angels. He can try all he wants, but God will always win. In heaven, this is cried out, Now hath come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. See, God knows the devil. He knows his tricks, he knows his schemes, and he's not going to let him win. And then when Satan saw that he had been hurled down to earth, he pursues this woman. But God gives her wings like an eagle to fly away. And Satan spews out this water like a river to capture her. But God opens up the earth and drains all that water down in there. The dragon is so enraged at the woman, he went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. So he fails to capture the woman, and he turns his sights to who is left, the followers of Jesus Christ, the faithful. See, God will always overcome the devil. There should be no doubt about that in our minds. He tried to take the throne. He tried to attack heaven, and God just threw him out. He had no chance of success. The God who created heaven and earth is still more than powerful enough to defeat each and every single one of his enemies. Jesus was attacked in so many ways on earth, but still accomplished what God had for him to do. He was tempted by the devil himself, and yet he still lived that sinless life. He took the pain of the cross, and he died for the sins of everyone. He was the perfect sacrifice, and he rose from the, the grave on the third day, defeating death, saving all, all who would follow him from God's wrath to come. Now we see how God treats his enemies. We also know that God saves his people and he avenges them. Now each and every one of us has to choose that side. You know, do we want to be those bitter, angry people? Or do we want to be saved and protected by God? See, Satan, he comes down here and he's constantly nitpicking every little sin everybody's ever committed. And he's going before God and accusing each and every single one of us. Well, what about this person? They did this, they did that. They did this other thing. How can you ever save them? How can you ever use them? You know, it reminds me of Job, where Satan goes there and he's determined 
to destroy Job, but he's not allowed to kill him. But Job held on. Satan is going to do everything he can to trick, divide, break, discourage, distract the people down here on earth. And the longer I'm down here, the more I feel like there are so many people blinded to the truth. There was um, some talk yesterday uh, around my workplace where people were talking about, um, you know, were there ever really giants? And then somebody stops and says, well, well, Shane believes there were giants. And he's like, well, I don't believe the Bible. And I was like, well, the scientists here, well, I don't believe him either. You know, so that was a fruitless discussion. But people are so blinded that they, they don't even examine whether the Bible is true or not. They just dismiss it and act like it's a book of myths. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. And they think that they're in control. But they're not in control. You know, there, there are simple things that we get to do in life that, sure, we have a little bit of control here or there. But we don't have all the power and the authority that God has, that Jesus has. I mean, God just says the word and it's done. I mean, when he created the universe and the earth, he told the stars where to go, and they went there. He told the land to come up, and it came up. He told the sun to go in the sky, the moon to go in the sky, and it happened. It doesn't say, well, then God molded it all in his hand, and it took a little while, and he had to do this or do that. He just says it, and it happens. You know, we, we live down here in this fallen world, and there's more and more people becoming like these hard-hearted people we're reading about in Revelation. And I heard the story of two men this week that, um, that I've come to know through working, working with them a little bit. And uh, one of them, turns out he has a 15-year-old son he's never seen because something this woman did to him. And then another one who has a son, he's like, I'm not talking to her. She cheated on me. I won't ever go around that kid. Their hearts are very hard. You can imagine that this is how these people were. At my workplace this week, on Thursday, it was a little bit slow. We're standing where we prep the food and by the oven, and there's all these windows. And there's a gas station next to us. And we look out the window, and we see... The guy who's running the shift, and he's a bigger guy, he's about 22, he's from India. Um, he comes around to the back of his building, and we can see the corner. Our cameras kind of cover the whole parking lot. And we see him punch this woman with all he's got right in her face. And uh, she's crying. And uh, one of my managers goes out to check on her, see if she's okay. She doesn't want to talk about it. She said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you saw that. I'm sorry this happened. She just keeps apologizing. Because in India, she later told us that women are viewed as property. That no matter what that man does, she's always in the wrong. And so she goes back in the store, and we don't hear anything. But we can see him walking around, and he's obviously pretty wound up. Um... Uh, so my manager keeps trying to get her water or anything, try to comfort her a little bit. And eventually she comes out there, and obviously it was very, very hot Thursday. She comes behind the dumpster, and my manager sits out there and says, you know, this is America, you know, it's not okay here. You have rights. And she starts to talk to her about all this stuff, and this woman who was afraid to speak to her takes a cigarette from her. She acts like she smoked. She obviously never smoked. So she tried to light the cigarette, she couldn't light it, so my manager lighted it for her. She was just looking for somebody to talk to. And she goes on to say, hey, I met this man uh, over in the UK. We were both studying there. He came here, and we had been dating a little while. I, I think they've only been together maybe eight months, and he told me to come here. So she got like a visa to come here, and um, she says he was really nice over there. Here, he just beat her up all the time. And he's a big, big guy. Um, 
So she's been hiding for like an hour talking with her. And he comes over and asks if she's hiding in our store. We say no. And then he goes out there, takes her phone, says, I've got an immigration on the phone. You're going to be taken away. Shatters her phone, goes to hit her. My manager, who's pregnant, steps in between them. And then somebody else comes running out of the store to, to attack the guy. And before you know it, we had to call the police. This happened on our property at that point. And this woman refused to press charges, but we were able to do something because we had it on camera and it happened on our property. Can you imagine how hard hearted someone would be to go and do that? Not only did after he did, he try to kiss her and act like it was all okay, you know. Obviously it wasn't. That's the type of thing I think of when I think about how hard-hearted these people are. And then some of the people in the store uh, reacted in different ways. Some were very compassionate towards her. And some said she probably deserved it. And I just thought to myself, Maybe we are a lot closer to the end than I thought. That people are that hard-hearted. That when a woman is punched by a man much bigger than her, that she deserves it. And that's okay. One of them even said to me, it's not my job to save anyone. And usually what I say when somebody says it at work, I just say, well, it is mine. They, they don't care much to hear that. But it just reminded me of, even though these people are crazy hard-hearted, there's people like that living in our world today. And, and it just it shocks me in my core, the callousness people feel towards people who, who are obviously being mistreated. It's not my job. It's not my problem. They just turn a blind eye to it. That is why God has called us to be the salt and the light of the earth, to be so different. We are to keep our hearts tender and soft. Now it's hard because we see all these things and it, it hurts because we care. But don't let all that hurt and that pain cause you to grow hard-hearted. Because we see what God's going to do to those people. We know that God is going to judge them. And no matter what their excuse is, God is not going to listen to them. It'll come down to do, did you repent? Did you follow my son? Did you accept him as Savior? Or did you just try to figure it out on your own? And because you were mistreated at some point in your life, you used that to reason why you lived your life the way you lived it. Selfishly. Pridefully. When you didn't care about anybody. I've seen Jesus take some of the hardest of hard criminals and make them an entirely different people. And use them in ways that only God could create. He, he still does that today. And he did it all the way back with the Apostle Paul. And think about all the things we read through Acts and through all the epistles. You know, Paul started off coming after the church. He wanted those people killed. He wanted them brought before the Sanhedrin and punished. And yet God used them. Satan can try as much as he wants to set up his counterfeit kingdom here on earth, but it is not going to last. The only kingdom that is going to last is going to be God's kingdom forever.
Jesus came down here and he took our punishment. He was humiliated from all these people, all of his enemies, Romans, Jews, Sadducees, Pharisees, and who knows who else was there. And he died willingly. Willing. Those of you who have read the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, Aslan the Lion, he is the one that symbolizes Jesus. And he goes and he dies for them. And he rises the same way Jesus rose. And the devil may think he won that day when Jesus died on that cross. But three days later, he rose from that grave. There was no doubt of the power, of the authority that he had. He humbled himself. I mean, think about that. He, he brought people back to life. He, he healed the blind. He healed the lepers, both Jew and Gentile. He did all these miraculous things, and he humbled himself to take that beating. You know it was within his power to heal himself, to come off that cross, and to just live his life. But that's not what he did. He was obedient unto death. He didn't do it for his glory. He did it so that we could all be saved. Now, when we accept Him as Lord, meaning Master, and we follow Him, we do that for all the days of our lives, not just when we feel like it. You know, there's that song, Jesus Take the Wheel, so Jesus is in charge. He's going, there's a lot of people trying to take the wheel back. They're sitting in the back seat and saying, hey, you missed our turn. We're trying to grab the wheel and take over. We do that all the time in our lives. We need to surrender it and leave it there. You say, I trust you. I believe in you. You created the whole world. You created me, my eyes. You knew how I would look. You knew how I would talk. You know everything there is to know. Why would I think I could do it myself? You can't. You can't because we've all sinned. Whether we knew it or not, I mean, some of us have become so numb to things that, you know, we commit the same sins and we forget that we've even done it. There are so many, so many people entangled in things like pornography, prostitution, drugs, and alcohol. They've been doing it so long that it doesn't even the wrong name. But God can heal us from that. He can make our hearts new and restore that feeling. I can remember after I got saved, I, I'd say for almost the first seven years, I felt, every time I prayed, I just cried because I felt so guilty. I caused him to die. I had sinned so many times and I I wasn't aware of it before I gave my life to Him. He did so much for me before I even knew who He was. And He does that for each and every single one of us. So if you haven't been forgiven yet, and you know you have sinned and you have not confessed unto God, and you want Him as your Lord and Savior, please pray this prayer after me. Dear Lord, please forgive me. I'm sorry. I take your Son, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior. I repent of all of my sins. Please help me to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray.